Prophecy at Earthkeeper. Edgar Casey was once asked, how will I know uh, I'm on the right path? And he answered, when what you are doing makes you more humble, more meek, more patient. And I was about 18, and that's not what I got into this for. I was shocked. I wanted a pulsating aura. I wanted glowing chakras, totally psychic, zapping sick people whole. Humble, meek, patient, yikes. Then I, about the time I was 26, I realized he was talking about my ego. <laughs> and that humbled me even more. One thing that's always motivated me is when I see something profound in the spiritual path, I'm always motivated to share it with others who are on the path. And others who see something profound are sharing with us, and that's how we grow collectively. Like, I feel like I've just been in the presence of a cosmic physician, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we all tend to add to each other's enrichment of understanding and love and patience and care for one another, and uh, hope, expectation. And that's how we grow as a soul body. You know, Edgar Casey said, we're all part of one soul group. And that soul group, he said, was spoken of in the book of Job in the Bible as the morning stars in 38 verse seven, chapter 38 verse seven. The morning stars sang together at the coming of humanity into the earth. Now, I don't know how you feel about it now, but at that time we thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> and we came here, and he says there is one body of souls, and we're all part of the morning stars. Okay, so as you can see by my little diagram, we are talking about a lot of different sources of prophecy converging. And I'm going to show you in the course of this chat uh, how they fit together and the similarities of them. And of course, you know, uh, Edgar Casey is a big source of my understanding and my training and my growth comes from him. I started when I was 16 and uh, now I'm just a little older than that and have learned a great deal. All right, quickly highlighting, and I'll go into detail in a minute. Uh, the Bishop of Ireland in 1139, Malachi, or a lot of people like to say Malachi, identified 112 popes in direct order, gave them all Latin mottos, and I'll go into that in detail. And this is apparently Malachi's, or Malachi's last pope, and I'll show you all the evidence of that. Nostradamus gave us three antichrists. He has clearly identified two of them, and we have experienced those two. 
And the third one uh, is the last one, and Edgar Casey has a few comments about that. Um, Edgar Casey laid out a lot of major physical changes on the planet, and um, two of them, two major physical changes have already occurred, one of which he said is the beginning of the change the planet's going to shift. Uh, Mayan, Aztec, Toltec prophecies, and you know about 2012. We'll look into that a little bit, and then I'll show you how the Eagle Bowl, or the Aztec calendar, uh, reveals more information, and that it all points to now. Uh, the ancient Egyptian pyramid timeline prophecy, which was known in the 1600s, but really came alive in the 1800s, uh, ends in 2038. And Edgar Cayce said, when it ends, the fifth root race human body will begin and it will have 12 chakras and be fully illuminated, much less dense. The soul will be able to be lighter and freer inside the new body. And then someone asked him in trance, uh, could you name the other uh, chakras for us? And he said, why? You're not using the seven. <laughs> I'd be real careful about talking with him. He doesn't put up with any lack of effort on our part. Um, the Bible prophecies, uh, you know in the Revelation, it says there is a golden age coming. Nobody writes about it. They all write about all the persecution and poisons and fires and all that. But eventually, if you read it carefully, eventually Satan is bound for a thousand years. And Edgar Cayce was asked about that and said, yes, there'll be no evil, no temptation on the planet Earth for a thousand years. Then he said... Put it in your heart to be here then. You have been here during the hard times. Don't miss the good times. And then Mother Mary, also with a certain anxiety in her prophecy, says you've got to get ready. You cannot go into the next era with any hatred, any darkness, any weakness in your system. You must prepare now because the next era, which is coming quickly, requires the pure heart. And I'll show you where Edgar Casey jumps on that and agrees with her. And then the untold story that we celestial beings, as the good doctor pointed out, we are celestial beings temporarily sojourning in physical terrestrial form. But you may not know it that there are several secret teachings that we will only be here for seven cycles, and the seven cycles are exactly known and laid out in the Aztec calendar, and Edgar Casey was asked to identify them, and then we leave. We're not here forever. We're infinite, eternal beings of the spirit, of the cosmos, of energy and mind, and we're actually a collective group like a flock of birds or a school of fish, we like to go together. We're social in spirit. Down here, we're all individualized in our own little body, separated, and we try to comfort one another that way. But in spirit, we're one, we're collective, and we're celestial, and you'll see all of that. So let's get going on, I'm gonna begin with the papal prophecies. It all begins with Malachi, or Malachi, however you would like to pronounce it. He was uh, visiting the Vatican during a time when there were two popes, because you don't know it, but there were anti-popes for a lot of years. If you study history, you learn all of this uh, challenge inside the church. But anyway, uh, Innocent II was the pope uh, that he ultimately, and the French ultimately, supported. And he was visiting him, and the Swiss guard were with him as he was walking towards his audience with the Pope, when suddenly he fell into an ecstasy. And they could tell he was seeing things and all, and they watched him, and after he came out of it, he had this vision of all the line of Popes, 112 of them, and he gave each one a Latin motto, and he wrote a manuscript. 
Now, there's a lot of controversy out there about this manuscript. Uh, I can tell you that the first time it's published in any way is 1592. So what was going on between 1139 and 1592? Uh, we're not sure. We know that he went to the French Abbey where he died in 1148, and he may have had the manuscript with him. Our challenges in 1871, one of the abbots writes a, an article stating, no, the Vatican Library has the manuscript of Malachi. Uh, it's not uh, in the French uh, abbot, Abbey. And uh, that caused a lot of controversy until people realized there's over a million books in the Vatican Library and 72,000 ancient codices. So no wonder it could get lost. Uh, but it's never been found. <clears throat> now, you might not know this, but the Vatican has contracted IBM to um, um, categorize and electronically uh, put the whole library uh, on the internet. <laughs> yeah. And nowadays you won't get burned at the stake for reading some of that. Nostradamus had to be very careful what he was reading because he was reading uh, secret books by Solomon who was a magician and uh, a, a magician of great power and uh, he would have been burned at the stake. So uh, anyway, I expect sometime in the future we'll all be accessing on our little computers or our watches the Vatican Library. Um, so there is controversy, and I don't want to hide it. We're not sure about this manuscript, but um, Arnold uh, Wyon's book in 1592 clearly identifies all 112 with the Latin motto, and therefore when we look at that and we go back through the popes, it fits so perfectly that we think, Wyon wasn't making up a fictional story. He really had seen the manuscript, and he was at the French Abbey. Therefore, he may have physically seen it. Now, when I show you the prophecies uh, most recent, Nostradamus is going to jump in, and you're immediately going to wonder, could Nostradamus, the Frenchman in Paris, could he have seen the manuscript. It is very possible. He could have seen the manuscript. He dies in 1566, so he did not see Wyon's uh, book, uh, but he may have seen Malachi's. So I just want you to be aware. But anyway, the info is so good, you just got to go with it. And so I just picked the last uh, century here because I don't want to go through all 112 with you. We don't have time. So as you can see, uh, Benedict the Fifteenth was uh, his Latin motto was religio de populata, which translates pretty closely to depopulation of religion, and that was during World War I, the war to end all wars, and really it destroyed the faith and the hearts of the Europeans. It was so bad, so evil a time. Um, that there was a lot of falling away from the church. Then comes Pastor Angelicus, the angelic shepherd. When I interviewed a lot of uh, Roman Catholic, uh, particularly women and all, of that era, they told me they felt he was a very angelic uh, leader of the church. Then comes Pastor at Nauta, which means shepherd and navigator. And guess what? He was the Archbishop of Venice. And he was truly a navigator and the, of course, Pope, which is the shepherd of the church. Then comes Floris Florum, and he had a floral coat of arms. Now, how could, how could Malachi or Malachi have seen this in 1139 A.D.? Unless, like William Shakespeare said, all the world is a stage. And all the people, men and women, are players with the script written. And they have their entrances and their exits. And it is laid out. And you come out and walk through it. How can that be that he could see a pope that wears flowers in his coat of arms that far back? You know, uh, now the Egyptians used to use an image of the falcon 
or the hawk as the higher mind, showing that even though you're on the river Nile and you can only see the last bend in the river and the bend in front of you, if you rise up like a falcon, like Horus, the higher mind, you will see the river from its beginning to its end and how it's all one and it's all already laid out there. Kind of like what my mother said to me when I was nine. It's all laid out before us. So it's, it's a paradox that we live in time and space, and yet there's oneness. Yet it's all known. Uh, Edgar Cayce said, try to understand that the creative forces knew the journey once it gave free will, it knew the journey and all the nuances along the journey. You still do have free will, but the journey is laid out and you walk it. And how you react to it or contribute to it is your freedom, but the path is still flowing. The river's still flowing. But here comes the fun part. John Paul I. De mediate lune, half the cycle of the moon. The shortest reign, he was only 66 and in good health, but he made three big mistakes. He came out after getting elected pope and said, Mother God, Father God, and all cardinals turned to each, what did he just say? This is a male-run church. Who's he talking to? Mother God, Father God. That was the first one. Second one was he agreed to meet the, will, the women's delegation from that Satan-bearing country of the United States. Oh, my God. He was going to consider a greater role for women in the church. But the third one cost him his life. He was going to investigate the Vatican Bank for laundering mafia money. That made it into Godfather movies. Remember? Yeah. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Here comes our friend Nostradamus. Now, you must understand he's in 1550. He is famous already. He writes the most popular almanac in Paris every year. He is the only physician of his time to have had success in healing the Black Plague. And basically, here's what he did. You and I know how the Black Plague went with the fleas on rats and all. Okay, he didn't, no one knew that at the time. But here's what he did. He would go to a home where one person has been diagnosed as having the Black Plague. That means the whole family's eventually going to die. He would go in. He would tell them to take all the linens and clothes and wash them all and hang them into the sun out back. Then they had to clean the entire apartment clear it and clean it all out. Now, where would the rats have gone? Yeah, to the neighbors. There's nothing to eat in here. It's all cleaned up. Uh, then, but here's where he was really cool. He made a pill, actually it was a ball, of rose hips. What was he giving them? Vitamin C. He also put other ingredients. And he made the one who had the ailment take all this, stay clean, the sheets had to be cleaned. They had to be in the sunlight. And eventually, the family did not get the plague as everyone else was. Now, you have to understand, a cart would go by every morning, a big wagon, and you just threw your dead family members in the wagon, and it went to the outskirts. This is how bad it was. And here was a doctor who was actually not having that experience with those he was just. So he was famous already. But he was doing some secret stuff upstairs in his room. And this was a something else. But here are some of his prophecies related to the popes. When the scepter of the great Roman is found, the day after will be elected a pope. By his senate, he will not be approved. The senate of cardinals. He who will govern the great cape, the big white cape, the Pope will be led to take action. Remember, the women's role in the church and Vatican Bank laundering money. The 12 red ones will come to spoil the cover. Under murder, murder will be done. Two. So here's what happened. 
If someone dies at the Vatican, they have to notify the Roman police department simply to sign the death certificate. They die all the time. They're old, a lot of them. So he goes up, and it's about 3 in the morning. He's on duty, this one detective. And he says, okay, who, uh, who died? I, I just have to uh, sign the document and all. And they said, the Pope died. And the detective goes, the Pope? He's 66. He just got elected. Yeah, yeah, well, he, he died. He said, okay, all I got to do is see the body and I'll sign the death. Well, we cremated him. And that's when the detective pulls his pad out and says, cremation's against the law of the church. They said, yeah, we're changing the law. He said, okay, I just want to talk with the last person who saw him. And the cardinal he's speaking with, Velo, he says to him, that nun has gone into a convent uh, in which she's taken a vow of silence. She cannot speak to anyone. Now, you know what happens to a trained detective when this starts like this. This guy started recording everything. And you can see where Nostradamus sees possible murder and then a second murder in cremation because it's against the law. They did change the law. They can do it now. But and do you see? So let's, let's go with this. Um, he dies, and now everybody's hiding. And so they have to elect someone who's willing to do the job, and no one that was involved in anything wants to be a part of it because they want to hide for a couple of years. So they elect a Polish cardinal. So all of us that study Malachi said to ourselves, oh, this, this can't be right. Let's see what he called him. Uh, de, lorbe, uh, de labore solus, the labor of the sun. And oh my gosh, that cardinal runs the labor unions in Poland against the Soviet Union. And we thought, how could he have seen this guy in 1139? It was just amazing. Two attempts on John Paul II's life were made, and one by the Soviets, and uh, that was, have any of you been in St. Peter's Square? Okay, so he was riding around in Peter's Square in the Pope Mobile, you know, but it wasn't a gunproof back in those days, you know, bulletproof, and as they hired a Turk to shoot him, and he had a, a weapon loaded with six shots, and as he approaches this assassin, he sees a little girl with a Fata medallion, and he bends over, the gun goes off, bam, 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 hits him twice, but not So fatally. he tells the surgeons, I want those bullets. So they take the bullets out of him, give it to him, and he goes to Portugal to put it in Our Lady of Fatima's uh, statue there in her crown, because he thinks she saved his life. Um, while there... He meets with uh, some educated monks and other priests. And as he's going down, you know how he does this stuff as he goes down the aisle, the uh, gauntlet of you know, blessing everybody? There is a monk with a knife up his sleeve. Look what uh, Nostradamus prophesied. Oh, great Rome, your ruin comes close, not of your walls, but of your blood and substance, the sharp one of letters, an educated person, will be a horrible notch, pointed steel up his sleeve, ready to wound. Now he is seeing this in a vision in 1550s of an occurrence in our time. Here's what happened. Notice that uh, Nostradamus says, comes close and wound. Doesn't say dead, doesn't say murdered. Okay, the monk jumps out with the knife and goes to stab John Paul II, and they jump on him, and he just nicks him and does not kill him. And I'm just saying, was, was that known? You know, when I think of these things and try to apply them to my life, this changes my whole headset. This gives me a whole different perspective. Um, and Malachi, also, or Malachi is scary. So the next pope after John Paul II is Gloria Olive. All of us who study Malachi's prophecies, including me, thought it was the Archbishop of Paris 
because the olive is the symbol of the Jews and that uh, bishop was a converted Jew. So many of us wrote articles foolishly, <laughs> in hindsight, that this was going to be the next pope because he fit the, uh, the depiction of uh, Latin motto by Malachi. So when the uh, German cardinal was picked, we were kind of confused. We thought, well, this sure doesn't fit it. And then he comes out and takes the name Benedict, and every one of us couldn't get to our computers fast enough. Because the Benedictines are the Olivetans, and the leader of the Olivetans would be the glory of the Do Olive. Do you see what? I, I, that was so perfect, we couldn't believe it. Okay, the last pope, the 112th pope in Malachi's prophecy, is Pietrus Romanus. And that's how you spell Peter in the Bible. And Peter means the rock, you know, uh, if you recall all that stuff. Pietrus Romanus, Peter, a uh, Roman Peter, or Peter the Roman. You can uh, tr translate it either way. And this is to be the last pope. So he comes out, and he gets elected and takes Francis. And so we all thought, whoops, there goes the Malachi prophecies. This can't work. So, but all of us know that S truth is wrapped in secrecy so that those undeserving do not see it, grasp it, and take advantage of it. Only the true seekers. So we all start searching around for how could this be Petrus Romanus if he takes Francis? And several things pop up. It turns out Francis' father's name is Pietro Bernardone. Which means Peter the Roman, because Badarnone is a uh, the sixth county in the Roman city. Uh, Augustus uh, set up eleven sections, eleven regions. So, like I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia, but you could be living in Princess Anne County, North End, a Little Neck, Pungo. Uh, there are a lot of counties in the city of Virginia. So. Uh, Bernardone is the sixth county or region in the Roman city. So literally you could translate Pietro uh, di Bardone as uh, Peter the Roman. So we're surprised. Now his, his mother, Francis's mother, Pica, she's a French woman. And her husband, Pietro, is away in France doing business when she gives birth to Francis. So she names him Giovanni, which is John. But when dad gets back, he said, nah, he said, I'm going to call him Francesco the Frenchman. Because he was born while I was in France of my French wife. So this is my French son, the Frenchman Francisco. Still, how do we get to Petros, you know, it's... It's tricky. Some of us looked at um, the Pope's last family name, his family name, which is Berg Oglio, which literally means mountain oil. And then we could see Assisi has got mountains covered in olive trees. So I just put a picture there of one of the big ones. And they stretch a long, long ways. This is not an isolated photo. And we thought, well, there's a little bit here, but not a lot. We're not sure. Now, um, Conchito, who had an apparition of Mary, she sort of felt that um, John Paul II might have changed the lineup because he sustained, sustained two assassinations and lived through them. Then John Paul come, the II comes out and says, I think... Um, Mary protected me and that maybe the line of popes has changed. So we're not sure of this. But you can be pretty sure this pope, if not the very last, is real close. And here's what Malachi said would happen. Now this is a quote from the manuscript. During a final persecution, I accented that so you know, a final persecution of the Roman church. 
sits Peter the Roman, who will feed his flock through many tribulations. This accomplished, notice it's past tense, this accomplished, so this pope somehow will accomplish things. The seven-hilled city will be destroyed, that's Rome, and that is perplexing, it's pretty straightforward. And the dreadful judge will judge his people. And that ends the prophecy. Now, if you look at sexual abuse, which is the great uh, challenge going on in the Roman Catholic Church and has been going on since, uh, believe it or not, you guys, it was first reported in the 1950s, but really didn't make it uh, headlines till the 80s. Anyway, this could be that deadly thing. So I put two quotes of Jesus up See here. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. He's holding children when he says this. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. Then he says in telling us about the end times, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be, then know the end is near. Now, this abuse is exploding with more and more numbers. And if it's true that those who are charged <clears throat> with spiritual aid, comfort, guidance, and have even taken vows of this, have been doing this, I think that's an abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be. I would keep that in mind. This, this could grow into an absolutely fatal situation, forcing some sort of change. But remember, uh, Malachi said uh, physical destruction. So how could that happen? And believe it or not, you guys, uh, it's easy. Italy sits on a lot of problems, and Edgar Casey actually predicted one of their major quakes coming. So I'm going to show you what happened in um, 2017 when the scientists of Italy put out a major warning that uh, Campe Fligre is reaching dangerous levels. That is a supervolcano right near Vesuvius. And those are very, very dangerous volcanoes. They are not like normal volcanoes. And here are the scientists around Naples and in Italy. Um, and you may not know it, but Italy has a fault running down its eastern coast all the way across the south. Here's Vesuvius, uh, Campe, Fligre, and Etna. There's a lot of trouble there, potential. So I'm going to jump to uh, Casey's uh, prophecies. Let me see if I missed the slide there. No, okay, we're going to do it next. All right. So keep that in mind. Destruction could occur. So before I uh, jump into Casey and tie him to, to this story, uh, I just want to show you the list of things he predicted that have already come true. You can look down the list yourself. He actually predicted La Nina and El Nino, the rise of awakening of China. Uh, now, he, you're, you're talking in the 30s and 40s here. That one blop or drop of blood uh, would be able to diagnose the body. So far, they've been taking a lot more than one drop out of me. I don't know about you, but... Uh, he was using the name Essenes before we ever discovered. He passed away in 1945. We discovered the Essenes Dead Sea Scrolls in 47. Um, and as you can see, climate change, political change, and so forth. Now, in preparation for Edgar Cayce's uh, uh, prophecies of physical change, I want to show you what the scientists tell us. We live on a, a planet that is a water planet, according to them. And once upon a time, it had one piece of land called Pangaea. That piece began to break into what we see today as the continents. And as you can see the stages here, and they have become the tectonic plates. And they are always moving. 
And when they move, these are the earthquakes involved, and they track them all the time. So you can see the ring of fire in the middle is the Pacific and how it got its name. This is a volatile planet, ever-changing. Here's the tsunami zones that they are reporting. And this is the big uh, prophecy that Casey gave in 1941 that came true on December 26, 2004. Watch for the strifes in the Indian Ocean. You say that these are the sea? Yes, for there shall the breaking up be. And of course, in uh, Bande Aceh, an underwater earthquake occurred that just devastated uh, the whole area. And you see all the yellow highlights there of every country affected by that tsunami. And I just show you this picture, not to frighten you or anything, but to show you the incredible power of nature. It, it is way beyond what we normally think of. And Lately, you and I have been experiencing and seeing a lot of this power because of hurricanes hitting the U.S. and tsunamis out there in the Philippines suffering right now. Um, these are powerful changes. So here's how Casey ties in with Malachi's prediction of the destruction in uh, Italy. He gives a prophecy. If there are the greater activities in the Vesuvius, that's Italy there, or Pele. Pele is the goddess of volcanoes in Hawaii, but it's also the name of a volcano in the Caribbean. And he's speaking of that one. It's the sister volcano to Montserrat that blew up just a few years back in the Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean. Then the southern coast of California and the areas between the Salt Lake and the southern portions of Nevada may expect within the three months following the greater activity, an inundation by the earthquakes. And as you can see, um, that southern port, a part of Italy, also there's a blue line running there. If you see it with little diamonds, that's the way the seismologists show the fault line. This is pretty serious. And in 2017, the Italian seismologists came out and warned their people um, it's reached dangerous levels of activity, so we need to prepare, we need to understand the potential of this. Also, objects strike this lovely little planet of ours. Here's a layout of where the strikes have been recorded, and here's a picture of one that we all like to go tourist and see and play around with. It made it into the movies. Uh, it's in Arizona, the Behringer Crater. And here's the big one that makes the press uh, for killing all the dinosaurs, but now some scientists are arguing, maybe, maybe not. Chicxulub, uh, it's a massive one, and you see it's off the north part of Yucatan. Uh, so there are many ways this planet, and you know what bothered me recently? There was a, a celestial object between the moon and the earth, and the scientists didn't tell us. They just kept it quiet until after it passed. <laughs> That wasn't fair. And then Edgar was asked what great change will occur in 2000 to 2001, and he answered that a new cycle begins and the poles will shift, the electromagnetic or the axis poles. There are two types of poles. Both are moving, according to our scientists. And as you can see here, there's evidence that um, in the last four million years, the axis around which the Earth spins has reversed its poles at least nine times. That's over four million years, so I wouldn't get anxious. That's an axis shift about every 444,000 years. The magnetic pole has shifted every 700,000 years, but it's already moving, and uh, as the good doctor pointed out in his talk, uh, pilots can't use maps that are over four years old or they won't land at the right airport. Um, of course, now we've got computers and all and they don't do that. Um, and that's because the electromagnetic field is, has been moving and is continuing to move. Now, our planet always wobbles on its axis. 
So we're not talking about the wobble, we're talking about an actual axis shift. Here's a typical uh, um, illustration of electromagnetic field around our beautiful planet that shields us from solar radiation. And when it breaks down, how it sh goes into this mode, and there's a movie uh, made by Nova on public broadcasting in 2004, and I got a DVD of it. You can still buy it. It's called Magnetic Storm. It's all done by scientists. And they said that this began in 1998, which is the exact year Edgar Casey said it would begin, uh, that it did begin. And so they tell you all about the magnetic storm of the poles shifting and that solar radiation will penetrate the planet and the northern and southern lights will be seen all around the um, planet. And then if you think of uh, the disciple Paul, we'll all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And Edgar Casey was asked, what does that mean? He just calmly said, we will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. <laughs> now, uh, when they went back to... Um, the uh, Russian nuclear plant in Chernobyl, everything was supposed to be dead, but the field mice were flourishing. So the science, this was 15 years after Chernobyl, which is a nuclear devastation radiation of the whole area, right? So they examined the little field mice. They had mutated their chromosome structures to live in the new environment. I'm sure the doctor uh, would say, eh, that's exactly what I expect, something like that. Our DNA will change, boom, we'll be new beings in the twinkling of an eye. Mutation has actually happened throughout the evolution of matter, and we're part of that physical evolution, so this could be part of the story, and we will actually be new souls, new bodies with 12 chakras. Um, as predicted. Also, the first cleansing was by water, the great flood idea, and it was promised with the rainbow that would never happen again, but the next cl uh, cleansing would be by fire. So I asked the scientists, uh, they know I'm weird, uh, but I asked them, how could you cleanse the planet by fire? And, of course, they w did not go to burning the woods No, down. they went solar radiation. That was their first thought. That would be, as a fire, solar radiation. But solar radiation could trip a switch inside our chromosome structure, our DNA structure. And that switch could be like these little field mice. I'm just pointing out there may be a physical change to the body that nature is going to cause to occur. It's an idea. So here comes Nostradamus. I've already shared with you uh, some of his great feats. Here's the way in his first book he describes what he was doing. He was hiding in his upper attic, seated alone in secret study, alone at rest on a blazing tripod, a slender flame flicks, a licks out of the solitude, making possible that which would otherwise have been in vain. So you get the idea he has they believe a polished mirror or a black mirror concave on a tripod and he stares into it until he goes into an altered state and starts seeing the images. Uh, this possibly could be a bowl with uh, water with mercury on it, which takes us back to Delphi and the Oracle of Delphi. Though I was just in Greece at the Oracle and they all wanted me to say Delphi. That's the way they say it. And I said, okay, okay, when I get back to the U.S., nobody's going to know what I'm talking about. And they'll think I'm an idiot, but I'll say Delphi for your sakes. And they're the Greeks, so, you know. Anyway, here he puts, um, he wrote a, a letter to his son, Cesar, and he said, uh, they come to, the visions come to me in imaginative impressions revealed by God Almighty. So we think he is staring and letting his normal consciousness fall away and an alternative consciousness that has imaginative impressions in visual form come to him. He believes they're divine. He actually does things uh, like were, was done to the high priest um, Moses' teachings uh, from God, how to get the high priest to go into the Ark of the Covenant by wetting the hem of his garment and stuff. N Nostradamus was doing all of those type things too. 
um, and he gets into the altered state. The part we're going to focus on very quickly is only the three uh, antichrists. And we clearly know everybody's researched it. These antichrists are indeed Napoleon was the first, Hitler was the second. He gives names and descriptions that every researcher agrees fits these characters. So um, we don't have to doubt that the first two were these guys. And then the third one is um, Mabus or Alas. And uh, here you go with a, qu a quatrain. Then Mabus shortly dying, there shall be of man and beast a massacre most dread. Then suddenly they'll, they'll awful, all full vengeance see. Thirst, famine, blood with a comet overhead. There have been a lot of comets, so you can't go and nail a recent uh, comet. Bloody Alice, his remaining force fails to ensure his safety over the sea. Twixt rivers twain, he'll fear an armed force. The angry black shall make him rue the notion. And of course, everybody thinks that was uh, Obama and his SEAL team that he released like a, a pack of hounds uh, searching for this uh, dark leader and killing him eventually. Uh, a lot of people feel that quatrain fits that. I don't know for sure. I'm just sharing with you that that's it. However, Edgar Casey comes out and he's asked what the Antichrist is and he says it's the spirit of that opposed to the spirit of truth. The fruits of the spirit of the Christ are love, joy, obedience, long-suffering, brotherly love, kindness. Against such there is no law. The spirit of hate, the Antichrist, is contention, strife, fault-finding, lovers of self, lovers of praise. Those that are those are the Antichrist, and they take possession of groups, masses, and show themselves even in the lives of individual people. So when I was trained with that as the spirit, I knew to watch out in myself. Every time I rise to a level of contention, backstabbing at the water fountain, fault finding in my own mind, be careful. I'm allowing a visitation from the dark forces, the Antichrist forces. So I went back to Mobus and all us, and I said, hmm, maybe it means maybe us and all us. <laughs> <laughs> and each of us, each of us can be the light that flips over the dark forces to the light as more and more of us accept our role as channels of the light and uh, work on subduing our darker influences, our darker tendencies, our human nature. Um, even to the point of uh, not thinking negatively about someone who's in a position of power, but rather trying to bring the positive light toward that force, which is real hard to do because it just upsets you so much. So... These are the forces of the light. Now we jump quickly to the Mayan, Aztec, Toltec. And the thing that bugged me the most was in 2012, Boston University in February found a chamber of a chronicler, a Mayan chronicler. And in it, he had carved on the wall the whole Mayan calendar going way beyond 2012. They reported it, and the media didn't want to publish it because they were selling so many papers and advertisements on TV saying December was the end of the world. And here, Boston University, a reputable archaeological group, was saying, no, 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 we found an actual chamber. There's a picture of it right there and the drawing on the wall in which a true Mayan points that there are cycles going beyond the 12, but the 2012 is the end of a major cycle, a very important cycle. And here it is, the age of movement or change, the age of change, began August 13, 3114 BC, and it ended its cycle December 21st to 23rd, 2012. 
But it was never the end of the world. It was an end of an age. And I write a lot about it in that Mayan book there, Aztec. Here again, they noticed that the sun was going to be in a position on uh, December 21st, 2012, that it hadn't been in before for a very long time, and that was at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. They took that as a sign of coming age. And now we jump to the Aztec uh, Eagle Bowl, they call it, but it's their calendar. And you see the seven ages there. Uh, the four squares are the first four ages. The central circle is the uh, sun god, and that's the fifth age. And then the two pyramids at the top are the sixth and seventh age, which are very quick. They are not as long as the older ages. They're going to happen fast. And uh, let me see what my next slide is. Yeah, good. The final two ages are depicted by these. And we are now in the age of the spirit of all living things. And here's where Edgar Cayce comes in and says, um, your true nature is spirit. Your true nature is spirit. Now, I read that many years ago, and I'm standing in this big lump of flesh and blood, and he's saying my true nature is spirit. So I spent a lot of time trying to feel my true self inside this carcass. And then when I saw others, I tried to look at them and look beyond their body and, and try to feel or see their spirit rather than their form. And I worked hard at it, and I was not doing too well until one of my pets died, a pet I had known for years. And I saw her carcass lying on the floor, and I knew what her spirit was. It was that part of her that ran all around the house, jumped on me, drove me crazy, um, tore up things I loved, <laughs> but I still love that little bugger. That was this pet. This was the vehicle it used for so many years with me, and it had left. And that's when I started to see it better and started to feel it in myself. And Edgar said, well, watch the spirit, because he said, you can raise the level of spirit in yourselves or lower it. And in myself, as a collective spirit of all the cellular energy and, and DNA energy in me, I realized raising, and then I would watch other people and I would see who, wow, this, this is a high spiritual energy I'm feeling here. Or, whoa, this is really low, dark, self-judging, self-putting down. Uh, and I would try to help that one turn that spirit and come back alive with what it was now an ember that should have been a fire, you know. And uh, the next age, which is coming soon, is guess what? The age of melting back into oneness. So you can see these are the sixth and seventh ages. We're in the sixth age. And I told you there's going to be seven. The Great Pyramid Timeline Prophecy that Edgar Casey talked about, but it was really David Davidson and H. Aldersmith who published this in the turn of the century, 1800s to the 1900s. And they laid out this whole thing according to the Egyptian Book of the Dead. They laid out the timeline using the pyramid inch, and they thought the world ended in 1958. And then in the 30s, when Edgar was asked about this prophecy, he said, no, they were supposed to go up the wall. <laughs> and if you go up the wall, my son James and I, he's really good with geometry and math and all. We calculated all of this moving up, and it's real tricky to do because it's not smooth all the way. And we realized it was 2038, and then we found in the Casey readings this cycle rhythm he called 38, 58, 98. And we realized, oh my gosh, this is probably exactly as we measured it, 2038. But I wanted to point out to you 2012, because Edgar said, as you go through, when you're in a period of stone there, that's granite, the dark color. <clears throat> You're in a hard era for humanity on the planet. When you go into the air pockets, the openings, it, there's more buoyancy, expansion. So 2012 was that uh, air pocket right there. 
Um, and then you come up to the apex and you hit the year 2038. So here I've got um, Malachi saying the last pope are very near. Uh, here we, we have the Mayan prophecy saying the age has now shifted to uh, us regaining our spiritual awareness, the spirit of all living things. We're going to shift from matter to knowing spirit and being spirit. Uh, and then eventually melting into oneness. Here's Egger saying, there are periods when even the hour, day, year, place, country, nation, town, and individuals are pointed out. That's how correct are many of those prophecies. <clears throat> now I say to you again, William Shakespeare must have seen this when he made that great statement, all the world is a stage. And all the men and women are players. They have their roles to play, their entrances, their exits, and the script is written. And I just think, wow, this is a whole different perspective of life. And you go back to the Egyptians saying, if you'll just rise up like the falcon, you'll see the whole river. But you are on a timeline in one part of the river. And that's part of your journey is to be finite while knowing infinity. All is one, but also individualized. It's somehow the game we're, we're playing. <clears throat> now we we'll jump to the Bible real quickly here. And in the uh, layout, now you know in Virginia Beach, we also have the big fundamentalist Christian Center as well as the metaphysical five acres of ARE. We have the Christian Broadcasting Network, CBN, the 700 Clubs, some of you. Well, I go over there because they're researching prophecy like I like. Of course, I cover my hair and I wear sunglasses. I know. I, I really. Oh, it, they have their own police force. You don't want to make a mistake over there. And I don't use any New Age words. Zip. New Age, I am not a New Ager. I am a holy, rolling, fundamental Christian of the Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> but here's the wondrous stuff they're working on. And it's amazing to look at if you really, really work with people who have devoted themselves to the Old and New Testament and analysis of those they can lay a timeline out like this that's amazing. But what really struck me, if you look down in the first big white box, the age of the Gentiles, I never even thought of this. The age of the Gentiles began March 16th, 597 BC, when Babylon's uh, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem. So here you have a very basic earthy culture invading Israel and Jerusalem and destroying the temple, destroying the temple. Now, they believe the Ark of the Covenant was secretly taken down the Nile. So and Nebuchadnezzar did not get the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, but this begins this age called the Age of the Gentiles. And that that age ended in 1967 on the Six-Day War when the Jews recaptured Jerusalem. Now, there's a part in the Bible that catches me, too. Uh, Jesus has ascended to heaven, and Peter is on the top of his roof. Uh, it's going to be rough times. So he's praying, <clears throat> and he's in a meditative prayer session when suddenly he sees a vision of God's hands coming out of the sky and opening a picnic bank, uh, blanket before him. And in the middle of the picnic is a big ham. And Peter goes, what? No, no, not me, Lord. I would never eat that unsanctified food. No, no. And so he breaks off, takes a breath, starts over. And he gets into it. And then the vision comes again. The blanket comes out. Boom, the ham. And now he's really frustrated. Am I, am I a sinner? Am I warped? Am I losing my mind? Then his friends come up from the front door and say, Peter, Peter, there's a bunch of Gentiles down here and they want you to teach them and come meet with them. <gasps> Peter goes, oh my God, the vision. I'm supposed to picnic with these uncircumcised partiers, <laughs> these Gentiles. 
That's what God wanted me to do. So he goes with them. Now, here's what's important. He's teaching them. They're getting prayerful. And suddenly the Holy Spirit descends upon all of them. And Peter goes wacko. This can't be. My people cut off our foreskins. We don't eat stuff. We're very careful. And these pork-eating, uncircumcised aliens to the faith receive the Holy Spirit. And he's in shock. And then he realizes, oh my God, the Spirit is going to take this to the world. Way beyond the holy people who carried the torch for so long. It's going out there. And so Peter changes his whole approach. And that's where you get this idea of the age of the Gentiles. But I just want you to, I want to point out to you, it's over, boys and girls. <laughs> yep, it ended. We're now moving into an international, multicultural, multidimensional era. And as you can see, looking at the uh, timeline there, uh, we are moving toward the 1,000 years of Satan being bound. And Edgar Cayce said, please put it in your heart to be there then. Uh, it's, it's a great illuminating period of time when only the souls of light will be here. And if you look down lower, you'll see Edgar Cayce stated that the time, times, and half times are over. That's what Daniel asked the archangel Gabriel. When will it be over? And Gabriel replied, in time, times, and a half time, it will end. For some reason, Daniel seemed to understand that statement and didn't ask a follow-up question, which <laughs> I would have appreciated. I would have appreciated a follow-up question. So here you go uh, with the biblical prophecy of Archangel Gabriel to Daniel, who's a prisoner in Babylon. Remember, he's a prisoner in Babylon. And, of course, there's the statement, a time, times, and a half time. Edgar Cayce comes along and says, we're in the transition period to a new era of good times. The time, times, and half times are at an end. That's a major statement. The second prophecy is that the temple in Jerusalem uh, will be destroyed, and, and it was, but an element of the Jewish remnant, remember now, a woman, a woman, if you read the Old Testament carefully, women always get the light back on track. <laughs> Esther is the woman. You have to have a Catholic Bible to know this, but anyway... Esther is deeply, she's Jewish, she's deeply loved by the Persian king. She is intelligent, uh, entertaining, she has a great mind, and of course, she's also beautiful. And she tells the king of Persia, I want you to go conquer those Babylonians and free my people, and then take some of your wealth and help us rebuild the temple. Well, this guy loves her so much, he says, okay, whatever you say, honey. And he does exactly that. And if you look through the Old Testament, you'll see everywhere along, Rebecca, Rachel, all of them are involved. Even Mary, you watch how it occurs. You can't get, see, the Essenes knew these secrets. You cannot get the uh, Messiah into the earth but through a woman. Are you aware of that? You couldn't get in here except through a woman? Okay, good. So the sacred people, the holy people, had read Genesis carefully. The Essenes knew <clears throat> you must be looking for a sacred female because at the end of the garden when they were kicked out, God turned to Eve and said, out of you comes the redeemer of this situation. So the Essenes were wisely looking for her, the sacred female. And the story goes on. I can't tell you the whole story. I don't have time. But females play a great role, and they still are. Um, the third prophecy is that uh, the temple will be destroyed again, even though it was rebuilt in, uh, and sure enough, Jesus in Matthew 24 is sitting with the disciples next to the gorgeous temple. And they say, isn't it an amazing temple? And he says, oh, not one stone will be left unturned. He's talking around 30 AD. 
And sure enough, 70 AD, the Roman general Titus roars into town, destroys the temple. But again, they believe the Ark of the Covenant was snuck away and was not in the temple. Went down the Nile, and some believe it's in Ethiopia. And that prophecy came true, and it was associated with the Mashiach, which in Hebrew is transliterated into English, Messiah. In Greek, Mashiach is Christos, because Mashiach literally means anointed with oil, anointed. And in Greek, uh, Christos means anointed. And so you have the anointed one will come, but will not be accepted. He will be rejected. Now, G uh, Jesus goes on in Matthew 24 to give a series of prophecies. I just redlined one that I want you to be aware of. Jesus said that all these hardships, all the tribulation that was prophesied by Gabriel, is nothing more than the birth pains of the new era and the birth of who we really are. We are dilating our hearts and minds. It is painful as a woman dilating to deliver the head of a baby boy or girl. We are dilating our hearts and minds to deliver our true selves. And it is painful. Even Jesus at the Last Supper turns and says to the disciples, Now my hour has come upon me. This journey is a lot like a woman pregnant. And what Father, should I take say? this away from me? No, for this hour I've come, and now I'm going to go through the pain of delivering this. And on the cross, he says, Why have you forsaken me? Nevertheless, into my ear hands I commend my spirit. He trusts, he yields, and all the glory comes, and he resurrects. And now he has a body that is a projection of a spiritual being, divinely filled with the Spirit. But he can still eat fish and honey with the disciples on the beach. You realize he does that after the resurrection. He actually plays around with Thomas and Philip, the two doubters. Yeah, go ahead, stick your finger into the hole in my hand. Oh, yeah, you can stick your hand into my side. This is, this is where we're all headed, is to be spiritual beings temporarily sojourning in physical bodies, not physical beings in love with spiritual things. Do you see the powerful difference in that position? That's what we're coming to do. You must get your chakras, your lotuses enlivened so that you are fully aware of the spiritual self, the spirit mind that is you, the energy that is you, and then let that sojourn through this body to bring light into this world for the golden age. These are the things. And notice the next line Jesus says, In those latter days, many hearts will wax cold. Don't let your heart wax cold. I know it's hard. I myself catch myself getting real bitter and real sometimes angry. Don't let it happen. Keep your heart warm and keep expectancy that the light will overcome the darkness. And as the good doctor said, the darkness has to be revealed and come to the surface so we can process it. And sure enough, I think that's what's happening. Um, now, another thing you have to come to realize is no matter how bad your life is and how screwed up your personality is... <laughs> You are a godling of the great God. The ancient Egyptians said that, and here's Jesus with the Pharisees. And they're about to stone him, and they say, we're stoning you because being a man, you make yourself God. Then he counters and says, does not the scripture, the law, the Psalms say you are gods? And you go back to Psalm 82, and here it is. I have said, this is God speaking, you are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and women and fall like one of the princes and princesses in this physical reality. If this is what possesses your consciousness, then you are what you think. If you can grasp the spiritual nature of yourself, there is no death because you are a spirit. The body can die and you live on. And... In uh, the 1930s, Edgar Cayce said, in the 70s, you're going to have a whole new view of death. And it'll really change everyone's attitude. What happened in the 70s? The medical profession became so sophisticated, you could die on them. 
and they could bring you back to life. Yeah, the problem was in the recovery room. They'd walk in and say, man, we had a close one with you. You died there. And the person would say, yeah, I was amazed when you pounded on my chest like that. The doctor would say, wait a minute, you were dead. Well, I thought it was strange, too, but I was standing over in the corner. <laughs> you did this. The nurse did that. And suddenly, these doctors, there are over 30 books on, on Amazon.com about near-death experience. These doctors realized I had the carcass absolutely dead. And some part of that person was observing in the room. That's the part you want to get in touch with. <laughs> that's the part that's really you. Okay, so we know the thousand years. Oh, this is wonderful. Uh, the last two chapters of the Revelation, Casey says, are the promises fulfilled. And they are, God will wipe away all tears from your eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. There shall be no more curse, which came out of the uh, Garden of Eden, if you read the three curses, one to the serpent, one to the woman, and one to the man. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. We really are infinite, eternal beings. Rays of light from the great ray. It's, it's something we've lost touch with. And, and in our mundane reality and our own egos, it's hard to believe this. So you must be working daily, maintaining mantras in times of deep reflection and uh, awareness and reading things that feed that truth rather than looking at things that distort and confuse you. Stay with the spiritual path. Here are the apparitions of Mary. This is one of the photos. I have been to the Coptic church in Zaitun several times. I have seen that very uh, top of the church right there. And in her apparitions, she comes out and says, you cannot enter the next age with any darkness in your heart. So you must purify your heart. And Edgar says the next age is called the age of the lily because of the purity required to enter it. And therefore, create in me a pure heart, dear Lord. Create in me a pure heart. Clear my mind. Now, I was about uh, maybe close to 20 when I, I read an Edgar Casey reading that said, uh, thoughts are things and they are recorded on the Akashic record and I can read your thoughts. That screwed me up for two years. <laughs> Somebody should have told me this was happening. I wouldn't have been thinking the way I'm thinking. And then I read the reading that said, new thoughts overshadow old thoughts. I said, I'm saved. Oh, my God. So every time a thought came up in college, I would say, no, not that thought. Not that thought. Clear that thought. No, we're not thinking that way. Come on, bring up something better. Yeah, there we go. That's better. That's better. And I was watching my thoughts because I didn't want Edgar reading anything that would embarrass me on my Akashic record. Uh, and sure enough, she's saying the same thing, your heart and your mind. And so your feelings, I, I read that as my feelings, and I've got to watch my emotions and my feelings and have the better emotions, the more loving emotions, the more contributing and uplifting emotions for others. And my thoughts have to not be so selfish, um, so judgmental, so condemning and fearful. No, no fearful thoughts. Stop that. Get expectancy going. Get uh, a hope and, and visions growing. Here's another photo from the 60s of the apparition. There were a lot of people who saw it. The first people who saw it were the Muslims. And they ran over and pounded on the door and told the uh, Coptic priest that there was a woman on top of his church. And, and so they were the first to actually see it. She's appeared to everyone, and she said to the children in Medjugorje, uh, there is only one God and one faith. Before And to the Rwandan children, he, she said, before God there is neither Protestant, nor Catholic, nor Adventist, nor Muslim, nor any branch of other creeds. The true son of God, or daughter of God, is whoever does God's will. And that's what Jesus said when uh, they came to him, remember? 
and they said, your mother and brother are at the door and want to talk to you. And he said, who uh, is my father, but those who do uh, my father's will in heaven. Oh, who is my mother and brother, but those who do the will of my father in heaven. So he picked up on the same idea. Now, the most famous prophecy of Mary is Fatima, Portugal. On 13 October, 70,000 people crammed into this pasture, and I've been there during rain. It rained all day during the miracle. I was there several times. Uh, ARE does tours to all these sites, and I was standing in the mud there uh, trying to have another vision and experience, and we had many miraculous little things occur to us. Um, and uh, so anyway, before I tell you when I'll, I'll, I'll finish this up, she prophesied the end of World War I, but said another great war was coming. She named the Pope who would be the Pope during the, the next terrible war, and that there was a great battle for the hearts of Russia, and would they pray? Four days later, Red October occurred, October 17th, and the Bolsheviks conquered um, the leaders of the Soviet Union and wiped out the church and became atheist and that was the big change she prophesied. Uh, her fourth prophecy was kept secret uh, until John Paul II released it and the media was so excited until they heard it and they said, oh, these are the fantasies of a young girl, a little child. Uh, and she said she saw the great leader of the church and some of the other leaders of the church go up and be devastated by arrows and bullets. Now, I thought, this little child, if that was a dream, I would interpret it as old sins and new sins, arrows and bullets, you see? Uh, but the press didn't like it, so it, the fourth prophecy of Fatima was never published. Here are two real quick ones. The chastisement, a warning, the sign, and a miracle are going to occur. Here again, at, uh, she said the same thing again to another group, chastisement, a warning, a sign, and guidance. All these things are coming. And she talked about praying regularly uh, for the earth and for the souls of the earth. And here's the final one is Edgar Cayce's prophecy that we will regain full consciousness. In the Piscean age, in the center of same, we had the entrance of Emmanuel, or God among men. See, what did that mean? The same will be meant by the full consciousness of the ability to communicate with or to be aware of the relationships to the creative forces and the uses of same in material environs. This awareness during the era or age in the age of Atlantis and Lemuria or Mu brought what? Destruction to man and his beginning of the needs of the journey up through that of selfishness. We have been on that journey. Now we need to... Uh, crucified desire and self and become loving participants in a great collective of the morning stars. Rise up again, illuminate the planet, bring the light so much that darkness falls away and all the hearts are awakened and we enter the thousand years when Satan is bound. And as you can see, all of these are coming together at this period of time. I can show you quickly the list of the seven. Uh, let me show you. There they are, right there. You can look at them yourselves while we unwind. But you can look at those and see how they compare to, to each other. And we'll just leave it at that. There we go. Amazing. Once there was a way to get back home. Once there was a way to get back home. Sleep, pretty darling, do not cry. And I will sing a lullaby.
wish there was a way to get back home. Where once there was a way to get back home. Sleep, pretty darling, do not cry, and I will sing a lullaby. Oh, you're gonna carry that pain
taste All you feel And all that you love And all that you hate All you distrust All you save And all that you give And all that you deal And all that you buy Big borrow or steal And all you create And all you destroy And all that you do And all that you say And all that you eat And everyone you meet And all that you dislike And everyone you fight And all that is now And all that is gone And all that's to come And everything under the sun is in And 